Great and um, so, yeah, next speaker is uh, Payal Sen from uh, the, the NIH, and she's going to talk about uh, epigenetic mechanisms of, of tissue aging. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing you can see my slides. Yeah, looks good. All right. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to first start off by thanking Peter and the Active Motif team for, uh, you know, organizing this wonderful event. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself uh, the last two days, and I don't think there are too many, uh, you know, symposia or conferences just looking at epigenetic uh, epigenetics of aging. So this was really, um, you know, uh, very, very uh, helpful. Uh, so I am a tenure track investigator at the National Institute on Aging, and uh, in fact, I celebrated my four-year work anniversary just two, year, uh, two, two days ago. Uh, so we are a newish lab, but maybe not brand new anymore. But the last four years has been uh, dedicated to really understanding how the epigenome fundamentally changes uh, during aging. Uh, so I'd like to start off by showing you this perhaps overused slide on uh, the nine hallmarks of aging. So uh, this was the, uh, you know, the first iteration of the hallmarks of aging from back in 2013. And a number of speakers, I think, um, you know, referred to the 2023 version where three more hallmarks have been added. But epigenetic alterations remain one of the original and primary hallmarks of aging because it occurs pretty upstream in the aging process. But the term epigenetic alterations, at least used in this context, really doesn't mean much because we don't know what modifications it is talking about. We don't know which direction it goes, whether it is specific for a certain model organism or conserved across species. So that's why we wanted to gain some insight into this. So now a few years ago, um, you know, my postdoc mentor, Dr. Shelley Berger, myself, and a few other co-authors, we wrote uh, what at the time was a comprehensive review trying to compile information from, uh, you know, multiple published studies to see if we can come up with some thematic epigenetic principles of aging. And I have to say that, you know, this uh, review is a little dated right now, so I'm very sure there are multiple additions to this, but these basic thematic principles, I think, still hold. So I'm going to go over these uh, very quickly. So the first is histone loss during aging, and this was discussed in the on the first day, if I remember. Uh, so uh, what happens, uh, so this was work from Jessica Tyler's group uh, who showed that in replicatively aged yeast cells, there was loss of 50% of the nucleosomes and the rest of the nucleosomes had fuzzy nucleosomal positioning. And what this um, uh, resulted in was general transcriptional activation or uh, an upregulation of transcription of almost all genes of the uh, yeast genome. Um, I have to say that such transcriptional amplification has not been uh, noted in human cells, but definitely the loss of histones is very clear, and uh, especially in senescent cells, you can see it. Uh, the next is imbalance of histone modifications. So the histone code per se does not change with aging. And, and uh, just to mention here, uh, you know, David Alice, who um, unfortunately passed away a few um, uh, days ago, um, you know, the, the code that he established that certain activating modifications activate transcription, others repress transcription, still holds um, during um, aging, except that the relative abundance of these modifications globally or locally change with age. So my lab, um, you know, kind of um, tries to understand um, uh, this aspect of aging, and I'll be talking today about one single modification and, and, and it's an unpublished study. The third is DNA methylation changes, and this is perhaps the most better, uh, like it's the better studied of all epigenetic modifications. And we've heard, you know, excellent talks from uh, Vadim and, um, you know, many other people who've uh, alluded to clocks, and we'll hear from Morgan Levine as well. Uh, so, of course, these methylation changes occur with age, but the exact functional consequence, as we were discussing yesterday, is not uh, very clear. 
Uh, but perhaps I will provide one little link in the course of my talk. The fourth is chromatin remodeling. Um, uh, these are um, uh, ATP dependent chromatin remodelers. Mut, um, uh, we don't know much about them at all during aging, except that ATP levels decline in humans with age. But we heard a wonderful talk from Doe, for example, uh, you know, implicating the WSTF, uh, ISY type remodeler in senescence and aging. And Vera also talked about this uh, Switznef complex. Uh, but again, to emphasize, this is a pretty understudied aspect, epigenetic aspect. Um, the next one is focal heterochromatin formation. So this is clearly seen in senescent cells under the microscope in the form of senescence-associated heterochromatic foci. These are dappy, dense structures that have a peculiar organization with specific histone modifications. But again, we don't know what their exact function is. And of course, upstream of all of this is a singular event, and that is the breakdown of the nuclear lamina. And uh, this breakdown occurs because lamin B1 is downregulated at the mRNA level as well as through autophagic degradation, as Do uh, mentioned. And, uh, and, and it is also exemplified in progeria patients, for example, who uh, Hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome patients who have a lamin A mutation. They have breakdown of nuclear lamina, misshapen nuclei, detachment of chromatin from the nuclear lamina, and this manifests in uh, premature aging um, um, uh, syndrome. Uh, and of course, there are consequences to all these changes, and uh, the consequences mainly, um, uh, you know, transcriptional changes. For example, I talked a little bit about transcriptional amplification, but of course, there are general gene expression changes such as upregulation of inflama inflammation genes. And then we and others, including Wei Wei Dang, have also reported some spurious transcription events uh, during uh, senescence and aging. So uh, the main purpose of this slide was to uh, basically tell you that uh, you know, epigenetic um, alterations are pretty diverse and very complex, uh, and much work is still needed before we can really comprehensively understand what's going on uh, uh, during aging. And I was really happy to hear Bing Ren's talk yesterday because you know, he's been involved in the ENCODE project, and, and, and we have to apply those kind of robust uh, you know, platforms and uh, principles, uh, but in the context of aging. Um, so our lab is involved, um, you know, um, involved in this, um, you know, whole uh, quest to find out what's going on with the epigenome with age. Uh, but we do this at a very small scale. So we use um, uh, C57 black six mice from the NIA rodent colony. Uh, we also have some transgenic models and we take a few tissues and then we do perform a bunch of chromatin based assays to understand what's going on. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we use several tissues, but today I'm going to be primarily talking about one tissue, and that is uh, uh, the liver. So why the liver? Um, well, the liver is the primary metabolic organ. It has clear age-related changes, uh, and we've uh, heard, you know, Aaron on the first day, and then Celia yesterday, uh, who talked about, you know, some of these age-related changes. Uh, but technically speaking, the liver is a pretty easy organ to work with. Uh, it's large, you get tons of material. Um, and um, again, uh, relative to other organs, it is a pretty homogeneous um, uh, organ because it has about 60 to 70 percent um, hepatocytes. So um, Regarding age-related changes, we know that you know it enlarges a little with age. Um, there's de deposition of fat with age, uh, resulting in steatosis. But the reason why we uh, really chose the liver is because it is one of the very unique organs in that you can cut off about 70% of it and the rest of it will regrow in mass and function in about 10 days in mice and about 30 days in humans. Therefore, we think the uh, the liver is an opportune system to study not only the changes, the epigenetic changes that occur with aging, but also the reversibility of these changes using the regeneration paradigm. So with that, uh, with this model, we asked our first question, and that was uh, what histone modifications are changing with age in the liver? 
Uh, so to address this question, we collaborated with Simone Sidoli at Albert Einstein, and we performed mass spec of extracted histones. Here I'm showing you a volcano plot of the modifications that either go up with agent red or down with agent blue. And one particular modification really attracted our attention, and that is H3K27 trimethylation. So I'm sure everybody knows uh, in this audience that this is a very well-known uh, repressive mark. Uh, it's put on by you know, the polycomb PRC2 complex. Uh, but the reason why we focused on this modification is because it seemed to us to be a recurrent feature in published literature in aging. So for example, we mined uh, data, again, mass spec data from mouse muscle stem cells, and we found K27 increases with age. And the same was true um, uh, from um, uh, human postmortem brain tissue. So, um, so having seen this modification pop up several times, um, we, we kind of concluded that there was a global increase in this modification, at least from mass spec. So we wanted to validate this in other, um, using other orthogonal methods. So we performed Western blot. You can see here the K27 um, um, levels go up. Uh, this is from liver lysates of mouse uh, of mice of different ages. We also did immunofluorescence studies. We found the intensity was um, um, uh, significantly higher in old hepatocyte nuclei. And in collaboration with the microscopy core in uh, Johns Hopkins, we performed trans transmission electron microscopy coupled to immunogold labeling. Um, uh, looking at the location of K27 trimethylation in the ultrastructure of hepatocytes. And these black dots represent those gold particles. So you can see in the old, not only are there more gold particles, but they tend to form these kind of clusters, which suggest some sort of self interaction. So next, we ask the question, where in the genome is K27 trimethylation localized? And to, do uh, to, to answer this question, we performed the regular chipsy assay, uh, and we called peaks um, genome-wide. So uh, this is a PCA plot of uh, the called peaks. Um, and you can see uh, that uh, it can nicely segregate young and old samples. Uh, here I'm showing you only three replicates, but We've done this over 10 replicates, and still there is a nice segregation. But very uh, interestingly, we found that we actually call less number of peaks in the old. And this is quite opposite to what I just told you, that there is a global increase of K27 uh, during aging. So just hold that thought, because I'm going to be addressing this discrepancy in the next few slides. So since we called peaks, we went ahead and performed differential um, peak analysis using diffbind, and not surprisingly, we found many more unique peaks in the young, only two unique peaks in the old, and if you look at the uh, signal at these peak sites, you can clearly see that this, this signal is lost in the old. So we wondered, where are these peaks that are sort of losing enrichment during aging. Uh, so they were annotated mostly uh, to promoter regions, but very interestingly, promoter regions of genes that encode for development and differentiation factors. So, um, uh, so for people who uh, know the polycomb literature, this may not be very, um, you know, uh, surprising because K27 trimethylation marks lineage uh, specifying um, gene promoters. But the very fact that, you know, this signal was being lost with age kind of told us that, uh, you know, perhaps there's a loss of cell identity. So to investigate that further, we, um, you know, uh, correlated our ChIP-seq studies to RNA-seq studies. Here I'm showing you uh, one differential peak, uh, and you can see the loss of K27 trimethylation at this um, uh, gene promoter. But when you look at the RNA-seq, it is quite the opposite. So in other words, the loss of K27 trimethylation here leads to derepression of this gene. And of course, we did this across all differential peaks, and we saw a negative correlation. Of course, the correlation is not super strong, but it shows you that at least a subset of these genes might be derepressed as it's losing K27 trimethylation. And we wanted to validate this uh, sort of in an, uh, using another independent um, uh, metric. So we decided to plot uh, you know, H3K36 trimethylation signal, which as you know, is a 
uh, you know, active transcription, um, uh, positively correlated with active transcription. And indeed, we found that, you know, over the gene bodies of these genes, uh, we have higher K36 trimethylation signal. And then, um, uh, uh, you know, knowing that, you know, polycomb and perhaps DNA methylation may have some sort of a crosstalk, we also looked at DNA methylation at um, uh, these sites. And we did not have, you know, methylation, um, uh, methylation information uh, from our mice, but we decided to uh, mine some already published data from Steve Horvath's group, and um, uh, we extracted the CPGs that overlapped with our differential peaks. And this is actually data from about 339 uh, mice. And you can see that progressively with age, these sites that are losing K27 trimethylation are actually gaining um, gaining uh, CPG methylation. And this result is actually quite complementary to some very recent work from, you know, from um, uh, uh, Steve Horvath and Vera and other people. And I think there's also a bioarchive paper now from Vittorio Sebastiano's group uh, that now uses uh, PRC2 clocks to kind of, uh, you know, predict biological age. So basically, I think, um, uh, you know, uh, both the Horvath study and our study kind of uh, say that uh, these PRC2 target sites are very important and that they actually contain certain CPG clocks, clock sites that are hypermethylated with age. So that's all about peaks. Um, but the question remains, um, where is the age-related excess H3K27 trimethylation? Because I just showed you a few slides ago that there's a global increase in this modification. Um, so to address this, we, uh, we did a PC analysis again, this time of genome coverage and not just peaks. And you can see again, nice um, segregation between young and old samples, suggesting that genomic regions outside of peaks are a major source of variation between young and old groups. So we frantically looked across the genome where uh, this excess K27 was, and it was only in the whole chromosome view that we actually saw these changes. So here in black are young samples and old are, um, uh, in blue are old samples, and this is just an overlapped plot. And I'm going to zoom in on one of these, uh, you know, broad domains, and there are many. Uh, here I am only showing chromosome 5, but this occurs across all chromosomes uh, that we've seen. And you can see here the accumulation of K27 trimethylation in old over megabase sized domains. So of course, this is a pretty unique feature in aging. So we wondered what are these broad domains? But in order to um, uh, you know, answer this question, we needed to somehow bioinformatically call these broad domains. Now, uh, conventional peak calling algorithms will not work because these are regions of, you know, uh, relatively uh, low enrichment compared to peaks, but they uh, kind of accumulate over these really uh, large regions of the genome. So we came upon this um, particular tool from Philip Collis lab called EDD or Enriched Domain Detector for Chipseq Data. And by tweaking um, a few parameters of this EDD calling, um, you know, domain calling algorithm, we uh, kind of got very nice, um, uh, you know, overlap um, um, over broad domain. So these uh, black bars represent our EDD domain calls. And you can see um, uh, here, for example, it, it nicely, you know, identifies this region as a broad domain. And here at the bottom, I'm plotting the gene density. Uh, and I just wanted to point out that broad domains um, are usually gene poor. And this kind of rang a bell, which I'm going to bring up in my next slide. So given the ability to extract these geno genomic sites, these broad domains, we could now query a bunch of other uh, chromatin changes over these regions. So um, of course, uh, this is our kind of control experiment. We call these broad domains, and of course, we found enrichment of K27 trimethylation in old samples in blue. Uh, but because these regions were gene poor, and we know that lamin-associated do uh, domains or LADs um, 
are gene poor, we decided to look for lamin enrichment. And indeed, lamin B1 was highly enriched uh, over these broad domains. And as has been reported in literature, lamin B1 is uh, lost um, uh, uh, during aging. Of course, this change is modest, um, um, uh, and uh, but still statistically significant. And um, uh, just to remind you that our mice are only 18 months old. So perhaps in geriatric mice, we would see a uh, you know more drastic loss and then very um, you know uh, interestingly and uh, a dramatic change that we observed was in h3k9 trimethylation uh, which also uh, like Bing Ren's talk uh, yesterday um, uh, uh, showed. So here, these broad domains with age were losing K9 trimethylation. And again, as has been reported in literature, but perhaps what we've contributed here is that there is actually a compensatory gain in H3K27 trimethylation. So we think that the loss of heterochromatin model of aging could be revised to state loss of constitutive heterochromatin um, um, in uh, model of aging. Um, so in other words, our study um, implicates that there is a gain of facultative heterochromatin. We also looked at several other modifications um, um, and factors in this um, uh, bro broad domain. For example, we did not find any enrichment of H2A119 ubiquitination, which is put on by the PRC1 complex. So these are not your classical PRC1 repressed structures. We also did not find enrichment of K36 trimethylation. They are gene poor. Um, we didn't find much uh, methyl uh, DNA methylation here, and neither um, RNA-Pol2. Uh, so then we wondered, um, you know, given that these are uh, enriched with K27 trimethylation, are they really just benign enrichments, or are they actually uh, you know, packaged into heterochromatin. So, so this is just a summary showing you that these are the three major changes. So, so to address whether they are actually heterochromatin or not, we uh, performed um, a classic biochemical experiment called salt fractionation, which was pioneered by Steve Henikoff's lab. So we took nuclei from young and old livers, uh, we um, uh, treated them with MNAs, and then did a sequential salt extraction. The concept being that at low soil concentrations, you're mainly going to extract euchromatin, and at high soil concentrations, you're mostly going to extract heterochromatin. So we took the DNA, made them into libraries, and we sequenced them and then mapped them back to the genome. So this is, again, the same chromosome 5, just for simplicity. And uh, these are the soil fraction signals over the chromosome. Uh, and of course, it's very busy. So I'm going to zoom in on that one broad domain that I showed you before. And as you can see, perfectly overlapping with this broad domain is signal from the high soil fraction, but only in the old suggesting then that these regions are really heterochromatinized. And if we looked at the young um, samples, the same fractions did not have this signal. So then we wondered what is the consequence of this broad heterochromatinization, uh, facultative heterochromatinization. So we had two uh, hypotheses in mind. One is that it should um, you know, prevent access to genome cutting enzymes. So we decided to use the titration of MNAs. And as you can see from this um, uh, you know, gel picture, um, the uh, old uh, chromatin was difficult to digest with MNAs. And this is particularly uh, you know, uh, true at this 2000 unit titration where you have many more oligonucleosomes, but the young samples in blue seem to be uh, digested. And the second hypothesis we had was it could also prevent access to transcription factors and RNA-Pol2 overall. And that would uh, lead to a global reduction in transcription. So uh, generally, people don't measure global transcription. Uh, what we decided to do was to use a spike in RNA-seq method um, um, and, and, and check for global transcription levels, global R mRNA levels. So uh, uh, this particular uh, method uses uh, your uh, ERCC transcripts, which are commercially available. They are synthetic transcripts. And uh, what we uh, uh, they uh, come in two flavors, mix one and mix two. 
they have the same four group of transcripts in different colors, but in different proportions. For example, you know, their A is four times more in mix one compared to mix two and so on. So we added mix one to young RNA, mix two to old RNA, and performed our RNA seq as usual. So the way you measure global transcription is to plot your observed mix one to mix two ratio, which is from your sequencing data, and then um, uh, against the expected mix one to mix two ratio, which is from your uh, known concentrations of these transcripts. So if the two were similar, then uh, you know, our data points should have aligned with this dotted diagonal, but instead you can see that, you know, they are well below the diagonal, which kind of translates to the fact that there is an overall reduction in transcription in old. And this we found across all of our young old comparisons, so multiple animals. Um, so, so, so then comes the, you know, more difficult question. So what drives these H3K 27 uh, patterns during aging, these opposing patterns of peak loss and domain gain. Um, so we decided to address, uh, you know, one at a time. So we first focused on the peak loss. So we know that, uh, you know, these developmental gene promoters, um, you know, are likely to bind the PRC2 complex. So PRC2, uh, you know, has a Four, uh, four subunit catalytic core, uh, the methyl transferase being either EZH2 or EZH1. And then of course it has some accessory subunits. So instead of performing CHIP for all of these different subunits, we took the lazy approach. We uh, decided to use a bioinformatic tool called LISA, uh, which can predict um, uh, you know, upstream binding factors. And of course the top hit was EZH2, but we also found other, um, you know, PRC2 and PRC1 uh, uh, subunit binding, evidence of subunit binding there. Um, and to validate this, we performed EZH2 chip and um, we found, you know, a strong signal at these sites. Uh, and of course, the EZH2 binding was lost in the old. So in other words, the peak um, uh, observation can be explained by the loss of EZH2 at these sites. And this is uh, a few uh, genome browser shots just to tell you like, you know, the loss was pretty dramatic. Um, but then why is EZH2 binding uh, lost at these sites? So we wondered whether this was a specific binding defect or was it that globally, perhaps EZH2 is going down with aging? So we decided to do a simple Western um, and you can see, you know, even though there is a global increase of K27 trimethylation with age, there is a loss of EZH2. Uh, so then uh, this means that at least at those peak sites, loss of EZH2 overall and therefore loss of binding explains why we lose K27. However, we noted that EZH1, which is a paralog of EZH2, goes up with aging. So then we wondered whether this upregulation of EZH1 then explains the gain in broad domains. So unfortunately, the EZH1 antibody does not work for CHIP. So we decided to use our salt fraction data. Um, so if you remember, these high salt fractions represent the broad domains. We found that EZH1 could be detected in these high salt fractions, but we also found some remnant EZH2, suggesting that there was no specificity at those broad domains per se. It was both EZH1 and the remnant EZH2 that were probably leading to its um, um, accumulation. So the, the, this interplay between EZH1 and EZH2 kind of reminded, of reminded us of something that's well established in literature. So EZH2 is a very pro-proliferative um, you know, uh, uh, protein, whereas EZH1 is more associated with quiescence. So we wondered whether these K27 patterns in aging could be mimicked by quiescence cultures. So we took Hep G2 cells, so they are, you know, liver hepatoblastoma cells, and we decided to um, uh, establish quiescence using contact inhibition. And we indeed found K27 goes up with age. EZH2 goes down with age and EZH not age uh, with quiescence. EZH1 goes up 
uh, uh, with quiescence uh, establishment, suggesting then that you know prolonged quiescence is something uh, that perhaps mimics um, what we see in uh, the aged liver. So then we asked one final question. So if prolonged quiescence is what is causing these kind of epigenetic, um, you know, K27 patterns, would breaking the quiescence restore youthful epigenome? So we decided to use the liver regeneration model to break quiescence because liver regeneration induces cell proliferation. So just to remind you, we can take the liver, we can cut off 70% of it, and the rest of it will regrow in mass, in, in mass and function. Uh, over 10 days in mice. So we took the before regeneration sample and the 10 day post regeneration sample and compared the epigenome uh, or K27 profiles. Uh, we did four measurements. First, we found that the broad domains were reduced in the old regenerated livers. We found that the peaks that were lost in, in the old samples at those developmental genes were regained upon regeneration. Genes that were derepressed with aging were re-repressed upon regeneration. And then finally, when we looked at um, you know, some liver-enriched genes, we found that the old regenerated sample looked more like the young compared to the old. And then finally, and this is uh, you know, very uh, preliminary data, new data, in collaboration with Vadim's lab, we sent our samples, um, we sent our RNA-seq data and um, you know, asked uh, them to compute uh, this uh, transcriptomic uh, clock measure. And we found that you know, liver regeneration indeed um, you know, reduces the epigenetic age based on this transcriptomic clock. So with that, um, I hope uh, you know, uh, I've discussed uh, uh, a little bit about epigenetic alterations, uh, which is an important hallmark of aging. Uh, K27 trimethylation um, uh, is a repressive histone modification that accumulates with age. We uh, also saw loss of this modification at peak regions, which compromises cell identity, while the gain of K27 over megabase size domains heterochromatinizes the old genome. And then finally, that liver regeneration can partially rejuvenate the epigenome. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, you know a lot of people, but especially uh, the trainees in my lab who've uh, you know really worked hard over the last few years. Uh, this work is mostly uh, by Na Yang, but also helped by um, everyone. James did uh, some of the bioinformatics uh, uh, in this uh, paper. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, great job, Payal. Um, that's a wonderful talk. Um, uh, I see Zhijian has his uh, hand up. Do do you want to do you want to unmute? Now, Payal, this is a really excellent talk, and very happy to see all this exciting progress from your lab. Uh, so, at the 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 gain of K twenty seven over the last and the loss of K nine trimethyl really amazed me. Um, so what, what's going on there in, in those labs that, that again, K27 trimethyl, but lose the, the K9? So are those labs, are still real labs? Are they still repressive? What do you think is, is happening there? Yeah, so, so, so that's exactly what I mean, we don't know, obviously, but um, that's what we want to explore more biochemically in the future. So, you know, the this uh, mutual exclusivity between K9 and K27 methylation has been kind of reported a little bit in other systems, but the exact reason is unknown. So perhaps, you know, um, you know, EZH2 binding and SUBAR39 binding is somehow, you know, uh, it's not able to happen um, together. So, you know, uh, having one modification repels Maybe having K9 repels EZH2 or PRC2 complex and having PRC2 repels SUVAR39. So we don't know, um, but we do want to, yeah, uh, look at it in the near future. How do you lose EZH2? Is it RNA or protein? Have you checked the RNA? So we've checked the RNA. It trends to trends to kind of be downregulated, but it's mostly at the protein level. So we haven't, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's autophagy or not, but- Let's uh, look, look at a nuclear autophagy together, yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, so, but it's mostly at the protein level, but I have to say ACH2 is a very strong um, cell cycle related uh, mm -hmm. gene. So I, I would imagine that it would go down um, just like lamin B1 the, at the mRNA level. Thank you. Payal, there's a, there's a, so there's a bunch of questions coming through, not surprisingly, about you know the, the, the rejuvenation caused by associated with with the re regeneration. Um, so you know one comment just from an, an anonymous attendee that you know this is this is fascinating and, and I agree. I've, I've said that to you before. I think it's really interesting. Uh, Ramin S S Sadri has a, a, a specific question which I was also, wondering and we might discuss more in the, the group discussion but um you know is that you probably haven't done this okay but i guess as a thought experiment do you think that uh regeneration would promote rejuvenation of a tissue that has a a high rate of cell division or is it just or is it something which is is perhaps you know occurs preferentially in in tissues that are predominantly quiescent or with with slow rates of, of division I think that's an interesting thing to think about right um so so I think that this is likely to affect mostly quiescent tissues because for example let's say hematopoietic stem cells are you know proliferative even though uh, their proliferation rate uh, you know slows down with aging and in fact ECH1 goes up with yeah. it in those cells. Um, but I think the effect would be more dramatic for, you know, uh, uh, organs, more quiescent uh, organs. Right. And, and I, I guess in general, we, you know, this, it kind of highlights an important point that we don't necessarily think enough about the differences in, in epigenetic mechanisms of aging in proliferative versus non-proliferative slowly dividing cells and tissues and there's likely to be you know really fundamental distinctions there correct yeah right um So uh, Hassan Hijazi uh, wants to know whether you've looked at uh, uh, histone variants associated with, you know, liv liver aging or 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 regeneration. So not uh, we haven't really looked at, you know, like in a very comprehensive manner. But from our mass spec studies, for example, we see that H three point three. Uh, goes up with aging, okay. uh, the aged liver. And as you probably saw from, if you remember from the volcano plot, the K27 trimethylation is actually on H3.3. So, uh, so, so that's one variant that definitely goes up with aging. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there are others. And I think our collaborator Yamini uh, Dalal from NCI is, is interested in this. Okay. Uh, okay. It's very interesting. Um, Og Ognian has a has a question. Has his hand up? Do you want to unmute Ognian? Uh, yes. Um, I thank you for the talk. It's really fascinating. Um, I was thinking about um, your um, analysis on the liver rejuvenation. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to understand that you looked at uh, epigenetic markers and transcriptomic age right after the liver has. Uh, recovered right after regeneration and okay. I suppose it makes sense that it would appear younger because it has just regenerated recreated itself so obviously it has to turn on a number of genes that are related to development and growth uh, I was wondering if you have looked or if you're planning to look at what happens then after time uh, because it could go either way it, this could be real rejuvenation so from that point it would just slowly slowly uh, age over mm -hmm. time like it used to but it could also be that as soon as it has done rejuvenating, it would relatively quickly go back to its state of um, quiescence. Uh, so I was wondering if you've looked or if you're planning and what are your expectations, what do you think might be the case? Right, I mean, uh, I mean, we would be interested to look, so maybe we could, you know, these livers were harvested about 10 days post regeneration so we could look at a later time point you know maybe one month or two months later and then compare it to 
uh, what the original old was, then old 10 days, and then old two months. Um, so, you know, the reason why I think K27 accumulates with age is because it's a very slowly accumulating modification uh, in, the, in the post mitotic stage. So if we have sort of broken the quiescence, we kind of have reset it. And then again, it takes that much amount of time to maybe get back to that you know, high level that was seen in the original old liver. So I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, even let's say two months um, post regeneration, it would, should still be younger than the original old liver. But of course, I think we need to do some, you know, clock measures to really uh, see if that's true. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll just ask one more question from the, the Q&A. There's a, there's a lot more which you can take a look at, but um, interesting one from Marta Kovacheva uh, says uh, very beautiful work, um, but you know wants to know more about is is the uh, is the rejuvenation associated with any change in in cell type composition, perhaps to perhaps a more youthful phenotype, and perhaps to be maybe a little bit more specific about that, does does it is it associated with any real you know functional benefits okay so for example decreased immune infiltration inflammation fibrosis steatosis those kinds of things which characterize the the aged liver yeah i mean that's uh, that, that's an obvious next step and un unfortunately you know we haven't done a very uh, good job of functionally characterizing uh, you know the regenerated liver but we are planning to perhaps establish a collaboration with, uh, I think, David Lacouture in uh, Australia. He, he looks at these sinusoid, uh, you know, features. Um, and, um, you know, we want to look really at the ultrastructure of the liver to see. Yeah, if yeah. Is, okay. Uh, I mean, one hallmark of, of aged liver in the mouse is that on a high fat diet, it becomes very much more steatotic. So that, that would be a relatively easy thing to to assay i think yes yes we've, we've we've done those assays so we could you know let you know how we've been doing those but it's well published right and also some uh, several metabolic parameters i think yeah we discussed this before okay yeah okay great wonderful talk pile thanks